We are a week and a half removed from WrestleMania 35. And I hear and feel and see all the Sasha Banks super fan accounts on social media crying and weeping and moaning where their queen is. When is she coming back? Why is she doing this? On the other side of the fence, you got the haters. Entitled bitch. She was never good anyway. All she did was botch. Goodbye. Go to AEW. We don't need you. Alexa Bliss is better. I've seen it all. So on Wednesday morning, I posted something on my Twitter account about Sasha Banks. There was a minor news story about Sasha Banks on Wednesday. I tweeted about it, letting everybody know what was going on. And then in the thread that I posted on Twitter, somebody cited Brad Shepard, cursed him out, threw him under the bus. Brad Shepard is following me on social media as I am following him. He obviously seen my tweet because like I said, he's following me. He probably scrolled down in the thread. He's seen his name being mentioned negatively. So he quote tweeted this person and he brought it to everybody's attention that he's a fucking idiot. And I had to reply back to Brad Shepard saying, people are bizarre. I don't understand people on social media. He's like, I know I get it on my side of the fence too. I am a fan of your work. Keep up the good work. I tweeted him back. I said, likewise. Thank you. With a little praying emoji. Then I clicked on Brad Shepard's profile and I seen that he was teasing a exclusive story about Sasha Banks on Thursday morning, 10 a.m. Go to the website Pro Sports Extra and read this exclusive that nobody else is reporting. So I lay my head down to sleep on Wednesday. I wake up Thursday morning. I sit at my desk and I have my cup of coffee ready. And I read this news article. And like I said, it's exclusive. I didn't hear it from anybody else. According to Brad Shepard, the WWE has given Sasha Banks two weeks off as of Tuesday morning. Not really new information. He goes on to cite that Sasha Banks was very upset about being split up from Bailey, and the Boston Hug connection is no more. Bailey was moved to the SmackDown brand via the Superstar Shakeup. Of course she was. Of course she was. Because WWE has tag team titles. What do you think they are thinking is the best course of action? Let's break up tag teams. We'll harp on that in a little bit. So, Sasha was broken up from Bailey. She was also adamant that the problem isn't with the Iconics. I have a problem with the Iconics because I think they're fucking terrible. And I mean that wholeheartedly. I don't give a shit who knows them. I think they are garbage professional wrestlers. That's just the way I see it. But they don't deserve the titles. They should have never won the titles. They are going to do nothing with the titles. But WWE producers and writers seem to think so. And this is where Sasha Banks' problem stems. Not just what happened at WrestleMania. For four years... This woman has had a problem with WWE producers and writers. We all knew that. That really isn't new information as well either. Then we get into the good stuff. Sasha and Bayley were told, and I reported this, Sasha and Bayley were told that their reign as tag team champions would last past the next show in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which was rumored to be in May. Now, they moved that show to June. No reason was given. The only thing I could logically come up with is the fact that that show was dangerously close to the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. Now, I don't really understand why WWE moved Money in the Bank to May to begin with. You got WrestleMania in April. There's no other pay-per-view coming out of WrestleMania except for the May pay-per-view, which was Money in the Bank. Why did they move Money in the Bank to May before this Saudi Arabia show was even mentioned? I don't know. The only thing I could possibly think of is the fact that double or nothing is happening in May the very next week following Money in the Bank. Maybe WWE wanted to steal some thunder 
away from Cody and the boys. I don't know. Because Money in the Bank, for as long as I've been watching this fucking product, has been in June. Why move it to May with no explanation out of nowhere? So maybe WWE was like, well, we can't have the Saudi show, which is going to be six hours, and then Money in the Bank, which is going to be God knows how long. Maybe we'll move the Saudi show to June, and that would offset the calendar a little bit better. Again, I don't know. I'm just coming up with logical thoughts. So, they were promised a tag team title reign past the next Saudi show, which then was rumored in May. Now, this is where it it becomes very head-scratching to me. They were originally scheduled to defend the tag team championships against Natalia and Beth Phoenix. Not at Money in the Bank, but on the Saudi Arabia show. Apparently, Saudi's General Sports Authority has approved one women's match for the show, which all four of those women would have been a part of. I didn't hear anything about this. You figured with this show approaching pretty quickly that that would have been in the news all over the place, or better yet, the WWE would have taken a fucking plunger and forced that shit down your throat every five minutes on Monday Night Raw. Nobody heard a goddamn fucking peep about this shit. So I don't know what is true and what is fucking fake news. This would likely also explain why WWE has been evasive on answering if they would have a second all-women's pay-per-view this year. Now, I can understand that logic, but, you know, it also works in the reverse way as well. If WWE does have one match that they're allowed to do at the Saudi show, and they're not answering questions on the Evolution pay-per-view this year, which many people, by the way, said last year was one of the best shows of the year. I thought differently, but that's just me. It also rever- it also works in reverse ways, because if they're doing that, then they're pretty much telling you that the only reason why they did Evolution was because the women weren't, al- weren't allowed in Saudi Arabia. And now this year, they possibly could be allowed, so fuck evolution. So they just threw the women a bone just for the sake of shutting them up. That's the way I see it. I don't know what you guys think about that, but not really a good look either way for WWE. If something worked and fans enjoyed it, why don't you do it again this year? But this time, actually give a fuck about it. WWE didn't give a fuck about evolution. They built that show in three weeks. They announced it with nine weeks. They started putting the matches together in three weeks. Why? Because they had to build for Crown Jewel. They had Evolution, Crown Jewel, and the Survivor Series in a span of five weeks. If that isn't overwhelming for a creative writer, my God, why would anybody want that position? On top of working with Vince McMahon. Anyway, moving on here. That's not even the case. Brad Shepard also is reporting that with Sasha out now, WWE is expecting Sasha Banks back by money in the bank, and a big win could be in store for her by winning the briefcase. There are already people having initial conversations about booking her to win the money in the bank briefcase at that pay-per-view. Really now? Really now, you're having internal discussions about Sasha Banks winning the Money in the Bank briefcase. Wouldn't you have to run that by Miss Sasha Banks first to let her know what the fucking plans are? Are you making plans up as you go? Or is this fucking bullshit? She's not even there. She's on vacation. And you're booking plans for her when she don't know what the fuck is going on? How does that make any sense whatsoever? WWE doesn't even have a match or a qualifying match plan. I guarantee you they don't even know who they want in that women's Money in the Bank ladder match. Yet they got plans for Sasha Banks to win it all. Really now. I heard reports, which I'll read in a second, that Vince was not going to bend over and kiss Sasha Banks' ass for any reason to come on back to the WWE. If this is not kissing her ass, I don't know what is. 
Hey, you're unhappy, but we'll give you the money in the bank ladder match. Sounds like kissing of the ass to me. I don't believe this story at all. And I'll get into my written statement as we move on. There's just so much news on Sasha Banks that uh, it's coming out of my fucking ears. Now, the whole Bailey situation. She was upset about Bailey being split from her and the Boston Hug Connection being finished. You know, I don't really care either way. I honestly think both of these women should be on their own. But again, they instituted tag team titles. They need tag teams. This was the perfect tag team to build that division around. And WWE, on top of breaking them up, pretty much broke up every other fucking woman tag team in the WWE. Now, Dave Meltzer noted on the Wrestling Observer podcast that another thing that really upset both Bayley and Sasha Banks is the fact that they were told that their tag team would be parting ways thanks to the superstar shakeup. Really now, because I read reports that WWE did not tell any talent where they were going or who was being split up until the day of only certain talent was told, which I'm assuming was an AJ Styles and a Roman Reigns, guys like that. This is what I read. Now Meltzer is reporting that they were told they were going to be broken up well in advance coming out of WrestleMania. Who the fuck do you believe? Who do you believe? You believe nobody. This has nothing to do with what is being reported. Everything that this woman is frustrated by has to do with what I mentioned last week. Four years of complete garbage that they've thrown in front of this woman. That's what's being built up. That's what's causing her frustration. Not the fact that they split Bailey up from her. Meltzer says, and I quote, So the Bailey thing, that had to do with the Sasha Banks and Bailey stuff, and them being very unhappy. It was not only that they found out that they were losing the championship, then they found out on WrestleMania Sunday... And they also found that they were being split up as a team. I read something completely different about the Superstar Shakeup. I read that they were told that they were losing the titles on WrestleMania Sunday. That in itself is enough to be frustrated. Especially after being promised you were going to have a long, lengthy reign as women's tag team champions. But the Superstar Shakeup news and rumors, complete bullshit. Now, nobody knows what is going on with Sasha Banks. The company gave her a couple of weeks off. The big question is whether she will show up to the Money in the Bank pay-per-view because she tried to quit privately. The company obviously did not grant her request. It was noted it's unclear if splitting up the Boston Hug connection uh, will help Banks, but it was made abundantly clear that this is not going to help Bailey. The splitting up of the team is not going to help Bailey in any way. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter also noted that the WWE's plan to take the women's tag team titles off of Bayley and Sasha Banks was not a last-minute decision. However, Banks and Bayley were not told about the title change until the day of WrestleMania. So, what I'm reading here is the WWE promised them a lengthy title reign. They had them win the titles at the Elimination Chamber. They had them show up on SmackDown Live. Have them show up on NXT. We will be the fightingest tag team champions that you guys see. We can't wait to come back to NXT and defend these titles with prestige and honor. Now, if they were promised a title reign and WWE had plans to take them off Bailey and Sasha Banks, but then they only told Bailey and Sasha Banks the day of WrestleMania, WWE then blatantly lied to Bailey and Sasha Banks without them knowing. Yeah, we'll give you a lengthy reign, and then behind closed doors, they were already conspiring to take the titles off of them. Only to tell them the last minute before they lose them to the Iconics. Do you see how fucked up that is? Who wouldn't be frustrated by that? They lied, and then at WrestleMania, they lost their reign to the Iconics. Now... They were also told on the day of WrestleMania that the company has had plans to break up their... This is all bullshit. This is all fucking bullshit. I don't know what to believe anymore. I I really don't know what to believe. Meltzer's reporting it, and Brad Shepard is reporting it. I don't know who to believe anymore. Now, the day of WrestleMania, 
Everybody was like, oh, they're throwing a temper tantrum. She's acting childish. She's a mark for herself. I can tell you right now, and I don't usually do this. I have reliable sources. I can tell you with straight facts that the temper tantrum and the bullshit that you heard that happened at WrestleMania did not happen. And I'll talk about that in a second because I did not mention that on last week's show. But what happened at WrestleMania, Brad Shepard reported on the Oh You Didn't Know podcast that Sasha Banks was threatening to leave WWE and those in the locker room knew about it. They just didn't think she was going to actually leave. However, this will not sway Vince McMahon as he has repeatedly said the company is not going to kiss Sasha Banks' ass in order to keep her. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, the, the news about her winning money in the bank is not kissing her ass, though, right? Oh, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Now, he says, and I quote, At the time, I was also told she was threatening to walk out of the company at any given moment, and most of the women in the locker room thought she was bluffing. Vince McMahon told those working as a catalyst between the two that while they love and appreciate Sasha Banks, yeah, right, no one is going to kiss her ass. She was promised, however, that things would get better. Again, yeah, sure. Brad Shepard went on to confirm Ryan Satin's initial report that both Bailey and Sasha Banks were laying on the floor in the locker room on Sunday before WrestleMania and then again at their hotel room in front of one of their rooms. He says, and I quote, I was told 100% mentioning that this was a confirmed source to the report. Bullshit. My sources say nothing like that ever happened. You take that and you do with it what you want. It was also reported that the line Corey Graves said about Sasha taking her ball and going home on Monday Night Raw, the fact that she took the ball and fumbled it, I believe is what he said, was a line fed to him directly from Vince McMahon. Oh yeah, but they want Sasha Banks to stay. Yeah, sure they do. Sure they do. Brett Shepard also said that the locker room situation with the Sasha Banks situation at WrestleMania, one person reportedly said that they don't blame Banks for wanting to be champion in WWE, especially since she dropped the women's tag team titles to the Iconics, who, by the source, who told Brad Shepard, said, the Iconics paid zero dues and can't work. <laughs> Whoever this man is deserves a fucking raise. Another source apparently had a much different opinion on Sasha Banks. He says, and I quote, a second source called her actions really childish and accused her of being a mark who is not able to see the bigger picture. WWE paints a bigger picture? They don't even know what the fuck they're doing while Monday Night Raw is actively live on the USA Network. They're still booking and changing the show. They don't even know what a big picture looks like. Are you fucking serious? Now, whoever that guy is, he needs to walk and get his termination papers easily. Now, moving on with the entire situation and this source who said that they were causing a scene behind the curtain at WrestleMania, Sasha Banks is reportedly influencing Bailey to act the same way. Again, according to Brad Shepard of the Oh You Didn't Know podcast, she has apparently influenced Bailey to act like this as well, which indicates that it's a bad situation. Uh, these are two grown women, and you're describing them as four-year-old children. I doubt any of that happened. Again, I was told nothing like that ever happened at WrestleMania. Now, this has nothing to do with the entire situation of where Sasha Banks is right now and what she plans to do, but I feel like it's important to the overall grand scheme of things. Sasha Banks and Alexa Bliss reportedly have been kept away from each other backstage in the locker room. Again, Brad Shepard reported all of this this week. He says, and I quote, I was told Sasha Banks has kept or has been kept separate from Alexa Bliss for the time being as well. 
end quote. This is an interesting uh, notion because Sasha Banks was blocked by Alexa Bliss on Twitter just before the reports of Banks telling WWE she wants to quit came out. However, the reasons for Banks wanting to quit had little to do with Bliss from what has been reported. Alexa Bliss has nothing to do with why Sasha Banks, or her actions, I should say, uh, are not the reason why Sasha Banks wants to walk away. Now, everything else that I've reported, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken fucking record, but they're, they're hoping that she comes back for money in the bank. And I love Sasha Banks. I really do. I support her and her husband in this time because I know that she is being treated unfairly. And I know WWE doesn't appreciate what Sasha Banks brings to the WWE. Now, I was sitting here this afternoon and I had to get out. I went to the local beer hall and I sat down with a chicken sandwich and I sat down with a few craft beers and I wrote exactly what I felt in the time and I wrote what exactly should be stated here on this podcast today to go along with all the news and rumors that we have about Sasha Banks that were revealed by Brad Shepard and Dave Meltzer this week. Now, I don't know Sasha Banks. I don't know her personally. I do know people that do know Sasha Banks. But from what I see in her actions is a woman who wants to make a difference more more so than anything else. It isn't about the money or the fame. Those are things that actually come with passion, effort, and dedication that you put forth in your craft. She has obviously done that. She is not enamored with that aspect of the business. She wants to genuinely make a difference. She wants to make a difference. If you were to look at Sasha Banks' career and all that she's accomplished, or as of late, lack thereof because of the incapable WWE creative team, what do you think she would tell you is her greatest moment? Honestly, think about that. If you were to ask Sasha Banks in an interview what She thinks it's her greatest moment. What do you think the answer you think she would give you? Is it the main event of TakeOver Brooklyn four years ago with Bayley? A match that is still the blueprint for the direction in which women's wrestling needs to go in? Could very well be. That was an amazing night. A night that I know exactly where I was, who I was with, and what our exact reactions were to that match. We've never seen anything like it before. And it was just a moment in time that we knew it was going to live on forever. Was it that match? I think I have another moment that stands out as Sasha Banks' greatest accomplishment. How about her match with Alexa Bliss in Abu Dhabi? That, to me, is her greatest accomplishment, or what I think she would give you as far as her greatest accomplishment. Look at that. A match with someone that is no secret she does not like She's not on good terms with Alexa Bliss whatsoever. Someone which is reported she downright hates more than I hate people who drink Budweiser at a fucking craft beer bar when you got 500 different options of beer to choose from. Or those people that bring to my attention the 1996 World Series and everything that happened in in that series after the Braves were up 2-0 against the Yankees and they fell 4-2 to lose that World Series to the Yankees in 1996, ultimately causing the demise of my Atlanta Braves, and a crushing blow. Yes, I'm an Atlanta Braves fan, sue me. I hate those people. I really do. Now, the point is, it was the first ever professional women's wrestling match in Abu Dhabi. It opened the gate for more of that in countries that have doors closed in those certain situations. She made a difference that has a greater effect than any championship title, than any five-star match she could have with the Beckys, with the Oscars, with the Ember Moons of the wrestling world. This is what she values. Do you know how important the evolution of women's wrestling is to Sasha Banks? She was photographed, if I could, if I could take it from Bailey's social media and put it on the screen right now. She was photographed with Sasha Banks and Bailey, or Sasha and, and Bailey themselves were photographed outside of the crowd at MetLife Stadium getting a front row seat to what Becky, Charlotte, and Ronda did in the main event of WrestleMania 35. She wanted to be a part of it without actually being a part of it. Now I ask you, for a woman who values on making a difference, for a woman who has been vocal about how much she cares, where were any of the other women on that roster standing next to Sasha and Bailey? 
Why weren't they out there supporting what was happening for the first time ever at the biggest wrestling show of the entire year? Is it because that they are self-absorbed in what they're doing without legit care for the entire division? Is it because they are jealous that they're not in that spot? I don't know what it could be. Now, you could look at it on the other side of the coin, too. Oh, it's just Sasha and Bailey being childish, looking for likes on social media. But they wanted to make a statement. The picture I seen was not two people wanting to get likes or retweets on social media. It's two women who want to make a statement. Hi, we're here. Where the hell are you guys? Now, if you are a part of something that is in the building stages, and yes, the WWE Women's Division is still, no matter what Ronda Rousey did, no matter what the main event and what that did at WrestleMania, they are still in the building stages. The most important aspect of this now is how WWE carries on the division without Ronda Rousey being there for the rest of the year. If you are a part of something that is in the building stages, you as a human being should be as supportive as Sasha and Bailey have been and will continue to be. I can tell you, no matter what has happened over the last four years with that woman, that seeing the neglect others have had for what they are building hurts her more than any title or any bullshit creative blunder that WWE has made. The creative side of things is obviously something that she has every right to be frustrated over to a point where I don't blame her for wanting to walk out, but when you have your peers pulling political strings for their own agenda without thinking of the bigger picture, WWE wants to cite that Sasha doesn't see the bigger picture, she knows she should be a, a part of the bigger picture, and they refuse to use someone who has started everything right now with the women's evolution. For someone that is selfless in Sasha Banks, it's the ultimate cherry on top of this cake, and a cake that Sasha Banks does not have a sweet tooth for. How many people actually believe Sasha Banks and Bailey, which was reported mul by multiple outlets last week, Ryan Satin being the main one, followed by everybody else who was at the top of the dirt sheet totem pole, threw a temper tantrum backstage at the biggest show of the year for WWE. Now, can you imagine two grown women who want nothing more than this division to be as great as it can be, kicking and screaming as if their parents didn't buy them a toy at the toy store? I don't buy that for a split second, and I can tell you again with complete honesty, none of that happened. None of it happened. I don't believe it at all. There was no backstage incident at all that happened at WrestleMania. Were they upset? I am sure they were upset, but their frustration stems from four years of terrible WWE creative. With so many selfish individuals bred in the wrestling world, most of which I'm sure are the biggest sharks in the WWE, how many people look at Sasha Banks and Bayley and genuinely dislike them? We'll never know. We'll never know. Don't you think it's completely plausible for someone who is against Sasha and Bailey or threatened by what Sasha and Bailey bring to the table to reach out anonymously to a Ryan Satin or to a Brad Shepard and cite themselves as credible sources to make Sasha Banks and Bailey look bad in the eyes of everyone else by citing bullshit rumors? The latest in the bullshit reports are them being promised to wrestle in Saudi Arabia and defend the women's tag team titles. I can tell you with full confidence that just like WrestleMania, nobody has any idea of these plans, and this entire women's situation stems much further than that. Something that big cannot be pulled by WWE, no matter how much begging or lobbying WWE does to have something like that happen. That decision will only come from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. WWE merely waits around and waits for their decision, and I don't think WWE going there for two shows is enough to sway a decision that big. How can she be upset over something that more than likely isn't even a thought yet? If by chance it is true, we can all understand why she would be upset. Like I said before, she is someone I am sure who values creating history more than anything else. Also, this is something that I hope WWE would give Sasha the honor of doing, seeing how important it would be to her. But do you have faith in WWE booking the women's tag team titles in the only women's match in Saudi Arabia over Becky Lynch, who right now is holder of both 
of the Raw and Women's Smack uh, Raw and SmackDown Women's Ta- Championships? I don't think so. Why would they book the tag team titles over Becky Lynch in that situation when Becky is the star of the entire division right now? And someone who beat Ronda Rousey. I don't have faith in WWE doing that at all. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So Sasha is upset over this reported reason. There was another report that several talents didn't believe Sasha was going to walk out and thought she was legit bluffing with another report citing Vince McMahon appreciates all that Sasha Banks has done but will not bend over backwards to kiss her ass and try to stay. Really now? If anything... I'll go buy a deluxe pack of fucking Burt B's lip balm because you better be doing everything to kiss that woman's ass to stay and actually promise her things will be okay, keeping your fucking word and let her shine because if she walks, she brings an entire fan base that would love watching her do what she would do for the WWE for someone else, more notably on TBS and TNT in the fall of 2019. In a follow-up report, WWE now reportedly is planning on giving Sasha Banks a huge win at Money in the Bank, winning the briefcase. Is that not kissing her ass? So what is true and what is bullshit? Is that what WWE calls a peace offering? Every time you've given this woman something to be proud of, you immediately devise a half-assed plan to take it away from her as if it's some sick game. Four years of this happening over and over again, what makes you think she is going to be thinking Things will change this time around. In just one week, since she's went on vacation with her husband to clear her mind, you've taken sheep shots on her through Corey Graves, having him say Sasha took the ball and fumbled it. You drafted Bailey to SmackDown Live, breaking up their tag team. On top of that, you ruined the Riot Squad by drafting Liv Morgan to SmackDown Live, all while Nia Jax is out for a year with double ACL surgery, leaving virtually no tag team on Raw outside of Natty and a hopeful to return Beth Phoenix. Nobody's talking about that, though. SmackDown is no better. The Iconics are there as tag team champions. They have no teams, legit teams, to challenge outside the team of Asuka and Kairi Sane that isn't even a real team. So again, I ask you, What makes you think she believes anything will change for the better when WWE has done everything possible to actively make things worse? (laughs) I don't understand it. There is a reason why so many talents are getting up and walking out or wanting to walk out of the WWE. It's because WWE isn't for the professional wrestler. They are for who they think is enough to be or good enough to be a professional wrestler. If you can make it in New York, they say. You can make it anywhere. The mentality of it is if you can make it in WWE, you can make it anywhere. But this statement, having to do with the WWE, is tired and dated. You make it if they say so, not based on your own merits. For Sasha Banks and all the hard work and care and undying passion that she has being overlooked, you put it on people who have done none of what she feels and who have not paid their dues. Walk. If I'm Sasha Banks, I take the chance on myself and bring the women's evolution to an audience that will actually care. I don't know what else to tell you, man. I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. Everything that I stated here needed to be stated today. Again, just to add on top of everything that I already talked about on last week's show. Do not believe any of the shit that you hear. Do not. I don't believe that there was a temper tantrum backstage. I don't believe that they were acting childish and they were acting as if they were marks for themselves. I don't I don't believe any of that shit happened. I, I do believe that there are people in WWE with a hidden agenda who keep their mouths shut, who anonym, anonymously want to go to sources like Satin and Brad Shepard, by no fault of their own, because it, it brings traffic and generates traffic to their website, but they're aiding in the problem. How many of these people in WWE want to throw Sasha and Bayley under the bus just for the sake of throwing them under the bus so that they look bad and they get bad publicity and they look bad in the eyes of WWE just to add to their own resume and move on up? Oh, look, Sasha and Bayley are in the doghouse. Now it's my opportunity to move on up. That's what I think is happening here. And that whole Saudi Arabia deal? You don't think that would have been announced already? 
I mean, we're in the middle, we're, we're, we're heading towards the end of April with money in the bank coming up. We all know WWE has signed a 10-year deal with Saudi Arabia. We know that that event is coming up. You don't think that WWE would have just laid that on us already? That's a pretty big fucking deal that I'm sure they want on ESPN and CBS and all these other fucking shows. Good Morning America, right? They won't let it go. And the fact that they're already talking about it? Oh, they promised Sasha this? When? How is that a decision that they're going to make? That's not up to them. That's up to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to do that and allow that on their show. Then you want to give her money in the bank? We haven't had one Money in the Bank qualifier yet. You don't even know who you want on the Money in the Bank show. You didn't even know where Money in the Bank was going to fall on the calendar up until a couple of weeks ago. How could you book this woman in something if she's not there? Don't you think you have to see, you have to sit her down and say, yeah, uh, listen, Sasha, we're going to give you money in the bank. And this is what the plan is going to be. I, I don't understand these fucking reports. I really don't. That's not the way I'd run my fucking wrestling company. Don't you think she deserves a little bit more respect than that? Yeah, we want you to come back. We'll give you money in the bank. What's going to happen then? You give her money in the bank, she'll get cashed in on, or she'll cash in the briefcase, and Alexa Bliss will end up being the fucking women's champion. Then the vicious cycle will start all over again. Or better yet, she'll cash in and fail. Just like Baron Corbin did. And then the record books would show Sasha Banks, the first female to fail a cash in. Because you know what's coming. You know what's coming. There's always got to be a first time ever, right? WWE's motto is first time ever. Oh, look, Sasha's got the briefcase. We'll have her lose. First woman to do that in WWE history. Yet you want this woman to believe things are going to (laughs) change. Give me a fucking break. My God. That is all the news I have on Sasha Banks. If I hear anything else, I will obviously tell you right here on the podcast, man. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I got more news and rumors right here. I got news on the original name, Hanson and Rowe, the War Raiders, because I refuse to call them that other name, whatever the fuck they're going by, the original name pitched to the War Raiders before Monday Night Raw was no better than the name that they were given anyway. What the plan is for the War Raiders on Monday Night Raw, WWE possibly putting together a new stable on Monday Night Raw, what the plan is for Zelina Vega and Andrade C.N. Almas, Bobby Lashley written off Raw, why The Miz was moved to Monday Night Raw, and why WWE split up Bobby Roode and Chad Gable. Don't know why. I got it all right here on the podcast. Don't go anywhere. We'll hit the intro, and I'll be right back. This is Off The Script, episode 270. This is part number one for your Friday, man. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. It's not been a good week, guys. It's not been a good week whatsoever. We got the War Raiders debacle on Monday Night Raw, where they're named after a fucking theme park ride. We got Roman Reigns becoming the greatest acquisition in SmackDown Live history. Apparently, The Rock, Brock Lesnar, and Kurt Angle do not match up to the power of the almighty Roman. And then on Wednesday, Wednesday, I'm sitting here, and I'm doing bills, paying bills, spending my money on things I don't want to spend my money on. I'm wondering about Erwin R. Scheister taking the money out of my bank account for the IRS. So I'm like, man, he's got to have his pockets full with my money after today. 
I'm assuming he took all the money out that he needed this year. So I go log into my online bank statement, and I see that the IRS did not take money out of my account. I guess he ran out of lube that day. I don't know. He wanted to fuck me, but he said, nah, I'll hold off. You're not good enough for me tonight. I'm going to go fuck somebody else. We'll get back to you when the time comes. So I'm looking, and I see other shit that should not be there. So I'm already stressing out about the IRS taking all this money out, and then I see something staring me in the face that does not add up. There was charges to my account in the sum of $2,400. One in Dallas, Texas, and one in some travel agency down in Mexico. So I call my bank up. I'm like, asshole, what is going on here? And he asks asks me a bunch of questions. Did I go traveling? Where did I use my card last? All this other fucking bullshit, this protocol. I'm like, asshole, I've never been to Dallas, Texas before in my entire life. And this travel agency, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's in a different language. I speak American. So he puts me on the phone with somebody who's investigating this. And I get this guy to tell me, well, the charge in Dallas, Texas is a Western Union. Apparently, someone was owed money. And I paid this guy, whatever he was owed. And then the other one was a travel agency in Mexico. I guess somebody was trying to book a fucking Caribbean cruise on my gun. In the sum of $2,400. Then he tells me that there was another $3,000 charge that didn't go through. Because I guess at that point, you kind of realize that it wasn't me. So I had to deal with this situation on top of the fucking IRS. So they eventually gave me my money back and they sent me a new debit card, but... To the fucking asshole that, uh, I guess, took my account information. Go fuck yourself. Hasn't been a good day. And you know what? You know what? I knew that my bank was going to rectify this mistake. The worst part of the entire week was the fucking Viking experience. Imagine that. Imagine that. To a point where I still, at this very moment... Still have people texting me about how awful that name is. This is Off the Script, episode 270, part number one for your weekend, man. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. I am JD, if you didn't know that already. If you don't, then I don't know what the fuck. I I can't help you. I can't help you if you don't know who I am. You should, because we do things the way that they're supposed to be done here in the YWC, man. Hit that subscribe button. Turn on that bell for all notifications. If you're new, thank you so much for finding me. Follow me on social media, man. JD from NY206 on both the Twitter and the Instagram. I would really appreciate your support on both platforms of social media. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys want to support the podcast via Patreon, it's optional. And it's the only way to get exclusive content not available on YouTube. So thank you guys so very much for all your support on the Patreon page. JD's Elite. Own one of the top-selling shirts in the YWC. That is the YouTube wrestling community. Become one of my elite members. Link is down below in the description of this very video and every video that I upload. Bonfire.com is the home exclusive JD's Elite merchandise on Bonfire.com. If you guys missed anything this week, oh my goodness, I'm getting eye cancer just looking at that fucking thumbnail. The most boring and bland acquisition in SmackDown Live history. Uh, Apparently, there you go. That's what I think of Roman Reigns right there. Blank screen. A blank fucking screen for Roman Reigns. That would have been better than what we got on SmackDown Live. Sasha Banks asked for her release. That was last week's Off the Script. Go and check it out. I had many people reach out to me saying that it was some of the best content that Off the Script has ever delivered. Sasha Banks then tells WWE she isn't coming to work. Go kick rocks is pretty much what she said. The only experience I want is Vince McMahon's departure off of Raw. Go and check out the rant that was Monday Night Raw. And then SmackDown Live, where Roman Reigns became the greatest acquisition in SmackDown Live history, which he is not. 
Uh, I think The Rock, Brock Lesnar, and Kurt Angle will have something to say about that, Mr. Vince McMahon. I also uploaded an off-the-script extra, which I'm assuming was that blank screen that showed up after the Roman thumbnail. Talked about Luke Harper and his release from the WWE, or pending release. I don't know if they're going to give him his release. Alexander Wolf. I got more news on him tomorrow, but he also quit the WWE. Also, the shakeup. We go over all the shakeup moves and what I think of all the moves made on Monday and Tuesday night. That is also uh, a video that I uploaded this week. Make sure you guys go and check out the link in the top right corner of the screen. Drop that down. It's going to be that little eye in the top right corner. Drop it down and you will see all the videos that you might have missed this week right there. Please go and check all that stuff out, man. I would really, really appreciate it. Harry's, you guys know the deal with Harry's, man. Harry's.com slash script. This is the official big boy sponsor of the podcast. Harry's is absolutely fantastic. I use it every single week. People ask me why. Well, I'll tell you why, man. Why did Vince McMahon change the War Raiders name when it was completely unnecessary? Why should you shave with Harry's? Vince McMahon doesn't have the answer. If he does, it's a bullshit reason, but I got the answer as to why you should use Harry's, man. Harry's founders were tired of paying for razors that were overpriced and overdesigned. They knew a great shave didn't come from gimmicks like vibrating heads and flex balls or handles that look like spaceships. Tactics that these leading brands used and have used to raise prices for decades. They fixed that by combining a simple, clean design with quality, durable blades at a fair price. Harry's actually also bought a world-class blade factory in Germany that's been making quality blades for over 95 years, and they've received over 20,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google alone. Harry's replacement cartridges are just $2. That's half the price of a Gillette Fusion Pro Shield, and all Harry's blades come with a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, let them know, and they will give you a full refund, man. You want to know why? There's why. I wish I could do the Simon Miller why, but I did that on the Off The Script Extra that I did this week, so I don't want to overkill it, but there's your why, man. What you're going to get, $13 value trial set, comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. You're going to get a handle of your choice, color is up to you, orange, the evergreen, or the navy blue, five blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. Rich lathering shave gel. It smells fantastic and it feels great on your face. And a travel blade cover as well if you're a man on the go, a man who loves to travel for work, or just a regular Joe like me who loves to have his stuff look nice and neat on the bathroom sink. Listeners of my show can redeem your trial set at harrys.com slash script. Join over 10 million who have tried Harry's and claim your offer today. Once again, that is harrys.com slash script. To redeem your offer, let them know that I sent you to help support Off The Script. Before we get into the second half of the podcast, guys, um, I do want to make mention of something that happened this week as well. Um, you know, what I, what I went through this week, you know, I, I like making a joke about it. And what I went through this week was not even anywhere close to what Ricochet and his family went through. And I want to show my support by really pushing this tonight and for the rest of the weekend. I'm going to leave you guys a link down in the comment section below of this very video. And I want you guys to help out if you can. If you can. I'm not telling you guys that you have to do it. If you can and, and if you can give and are able to give. Ricochet's mother's house burned down this week, and he set up a GoFundMe page. Like I said, I'll link you the GoFundMe page down in the comments below. The fans and the support that he's gotten from his peers is a wonderful thing to see. They've raised close to $12,000 up to this very hour, after one day. Fans coming out, showing their support. I know Natalia Neidhart came out and donated, Ricochet donated. $2,000 of his own money. Uh, Jessamine Duke down in NXT donated. Fans support all over the world for this heartbreaking moment. And it's just a great thing to see. And I want to push it all weekend on the podcast to bring awareness to this and, and have as much help as we can offer get to Ricochet. 
So if you guys can give, please do so, man. Link will be down in the comment section of this very video. I'd love to see that number rise to 15, 20, 25, 30 thousand dollars and beyond to help his mother man what a terrible tragedy thankfully nobody was hurt or worse off killed in this terrible accident but uh nothing but love thoughts and prayers go out to ricochet man you know i, I remember when i started with house of glory my first night on the job was a ricochet match with anthony gangone and i'm like i don't even know what the fuck life is right now man you know and now here he is in wwe and I'm so happy for him to achieve this success. I know without a shadow of a doubt that man's going to be the future of this company, man. They, they, would be, they would be foolish to not see that in him, really. He is a future WWE champion. I think he's going to bring greatness to Monday Night Raw. I hope so. But, uh, you know, going away from that, man, I, I love what the man has done. And if we can help him out in any way, man, I would really, really appreciate it. So let's do it. Let's help Ricochet and his mother out. Uh, with this terrible tragedy. Link, again, will be down in the comment section below of this very video and every video I upload this weekend right here on Off The Script. The Viking experience. Oh, my God. I promised myself I wouldn't say that, man. It, it actually, it sucks more and more every time you say it. It really does. The War Raiders. The War Raiders, which, by the way, if you were watching NXT, they had new merchandise made with the War Raiders name and logo on it. Hanson and Rowe came out of William Regal's office because the Street Profits wanted a tag team title match, and I'm laughing my ass off. I'm like, well, there you go. Does anybody have access to that t-shirt? I'd like to buy one, please. I really would. I totally would. Now, they made their debut on Monday night. As NXT Tag Team Champions, but did you think Vince McMahon sent him or sent them out there, I should say, with the Tag Team Championships of NXT? Of course not. Because what the fuck is NXT? Now, the Viking experience, being that I have to fucking mention the name because that's what they're going by now, that wasn't even the original name they were going to give these guys. The Viking Experience came out on Raw, and to the dismay of everybody, especially people on my side, we tweeted Triple H and Vince McMahon. There's absolutely no way Triple H did not see our tweet. Almost 6,000 likes. This one got more than that debacle of a Monday Night Raw we tweeted Vince McMahon at. I don't know what's more important, the fact that these guys are loved by everybody, and we want them to succeed with a real fucking tag team name? Or the fact that this takes higher precedent than fucking Monday Night Raw's quality? I don't know. I think this one broke everybody's fucking back. The, the straw that broke the camel's back was this one. They couldn't take anymore. Now, they came out. They're still tag team champions in NXT. No sign of the titles on Monday Night Raw. The War Raiders, Hanson and Rowe, are now Ivar... And Eric. I don't know where they got these names from, but to be honest with you, I would not be surprised at all. And people joked, people joked that Vince typed in Google on his mobile device. He typed in cool Viking names, and the first thing that showed up was Ivar and Eric. Now, the Viking experience is an actual tour in Norway. As if this is a fucking joke to everybody. This is an actual thing. VisitNorway.com has a Viking experience where you dress up as a Viking. You walk the path of a Viking. You eat like a Viking. You live Viking culture. This is a real thing. So, Hanson and Rowe are now Ivar and Eric. I'm sure you could come up with much cooler names than that. However, that was not the original name that was pitched to them, according to Mike Johnson of PW Insider. At one point, the duo was slated to be billed as the Berserkers, which is actually worse than the Viking experience, because all I think of when I hear about the Berserkers or, or anything having to do with the Berserker is a mid-card act in the 90s in WWE. You know, you know the guy, the berserker that came out with the fuzzy fucking outfit that I think his most memorable feud was The Undertaker? Huss! Huss! 
Huss! Huss! That guy! Remember him? Yeah, they want to name them after him. I don't understand it. So, they were supposed to be billed as the Berserkers, but it was changed as they got closer and closer to Monday Night Raw. Meaning that the Viking experience was something that they came up with right before they went out on Monday Night Raw during the shakeup. It stands to reason why the WWE didn't go with the Berserkers. After all, the Berserker actually made headlines last week. I didn't know about this. He actually made headlines last week for a DUI arrest. However, you have to wonder why they even changed the War Raiders name in the first place. Now, people are saying, and I mentioned this on my Monday Night Raw review, that if WWE changed their name because they didn't want people chanting war during their match or during their intro on television, then it didn't work because the Montreal crowd still knew who they were and they chanted war anyway on live television. Hopefully, people continue to chant war at the War Raiders. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. Now, there is a plan for these guys on Monday Night Raw, believe it or not. Dave Meltzer approached this subject during Wrestling Observer Live, and although he didn't have a clear answer as to why Vince McMahon changed their name, at least it seems like he has big plans for them. Meltzer says, and I quote, They're clearly grooming them for a tag team title shot against Ryder and Hawkins, so it was a good debut. As far as, the, as far as why they weren't listed on the graphic, I don't know. I don't know. End quote. The Viking experience might not be the best name Vince McMahon has come up with, but at least it looks like WWE is going to try and push former War Raiders Hanson and Rowe. I don't know. I don't know why. This is all a Vince McMahon idea. I still don't know why this, of all the things you have to fuck with, there are many other issues in this company that need your attention, and this is what you're fucking focusing on. The goddamn War Raiders, which were great down in NXT. I mentioned this on Monday night. They gave you two of the best tag team ma two matches that will be on the top 10 list in 2019 with the Undisputed Era, which, by the way, everybody's joking about... Whoever's coming up from NXT is going to be labeled the experience, the undisputed experience, or they're going to butcher Velveteen's dream, Velveteen Dream's name. They're just going to call him Purple Rain or whatever the fuck they're going to go, but I don't know. Everybody's an experience now. Everybody changed their Twitter, hand, Twitter handle to blah, blah, blah experience. It's a fucking joke. It's a goddamn joke. Two tag team matches that these guys had. They were groomed in NXT as the War Raiders. I don't understand why there's such a disconnect with what is going on in NXT. This is the end-all be-all to Vince McMahon not watching NXT or anyone in his camp watching NXT. This is it. Triple H mentioned that, oh yeah, Vince McMahon watches NXT. No, we don't. No, we don't. Because clearly, he didn't know who these guys were and it took him to... Changed their name five minutes before they went out on Monday Night Raw. I don't understand why this was not a problem for an entire fucking year, but now all of a sudden it's a problem on Monday Night Raw. Why? These guys were groomed, trained at the PC, were formatted for television, they were given an entrance and a theme music as the War Raiders, and now everything that they've given these guys in NXT is completely, fuck you, gone. Now, the idea of them changing the War Raiders' name because they don't want war chanted on television, this is the society we're living in right now. But it didn't stop Tom Phillips from calling Ember Moon the war goddess on commentary, and one of the biggest movies of all time, Infinity War... I don't understand. Is it is it Vince McMahon just wanted to fucking poke fun at NXT and embarrass NXT on his own dime? Or the fact that they are PG garbage? I don't get it. I think I'm going to go with the first one. 
There's no fucking way that anybody in this company thinks this is a good idea. No, none. I, I don't understand how there's people in the community that think this is not a, a, a fucking shit of a name. It's not even about the fucking name change. And I mentioned this on Monday night. It's not about the fucking name change. It, it's about the fact that you do everything you got to do to get these guys to the next level. And then you want to fucking change it. For no reason. Why does Triple H even show up to work? Why does he employ anybody down at the PC to get these guys ready for the main roster if all Vince McMahon is going to do is sabotage everything that Triple H is doing? There's nobody in this company that can convince me that this man, this senile fuck, is not internally killing his company. This is a... This is an exact fucking thing that I talked about over and over and over again. This is Vince McMahon taking his own fucking brand that he's paying for. And he sees that it's doing better than whatever he's doing on the main roster. And every chance he's got, you got to stand out more so than anybody else for Vince to fall in love with you. If you do not stand out to him, he will do everything in his power to kill it. And I mentioned this on my tweet. Triple H creates and has been creating for years in NXT, and Vince McMahon kills. There is absolutely no reason why this name change should have went through and made the final script. It's not about the name change. It's about what the fucking product is in NXT and what they mean to the future of WWE. There is no point in NXT if they're doing everything right ultimately to be changed on the main roster. Do you know how fucking demoralizing that is? Do you know that these guys were known as Hanson and Rowe their entire careers and now they step foot on Monday Night Raw in five minutes and their careers are ruined? Everything is in a name. This is what they will be known by for the rest of their main roster run as long as they're with this company. Ivar and Eric. Meanwhile, on NXT, they're out wearing fucking War Raiders merchandise. The Street Profits are mentioning the War Raiders. It's, it's fucking embarrassing. I still am very upset about the War Raiders. So much so that my, that my friend, Mr. Soldier, you guys of the old school, know me and Mr. Soldier. He tweets out, reading this article, it makes logic, it makes no sense on why Vince McMahon changed it. The chance war, of course. And he doesn't like the fans throwing up the horns and chanting war, war, war. I got to admit, Viking experience is horrible. LOL. What's up, bro, if you're watching me? God awful. I'll never get over it. So much so that from this point on, I am not calling them by that name. Everything that we do as far as what they do, they are known as the War Raiders. Hanson and Rowe. I'm sorry. WWE putting together a new brand new stable on Monday Night Raw. Mike Johnson of PW Insider Elite Audio said that WWE is toying with the idea of placing Rey Mysterio as the leader of a new stable. This could end up being a trio of luchadors on SmackDown Live or Monday Night Raw. That could be much bigger than the Lucha House Party. Clearly, this was written before the shakeup. There was talk a while back of Andrade Sin Cara and Rey Mysterio in some sort of trio, and we will see if that actually goes forward with the shakeup. Rey Mysterio and Andrade ended up on the same brand after the Superstar Shakeup, but Andrade is a heel with Mysterio being an overwhelming babyface. It wouldn't take too much to turn Andrade babyface, especially if he can save Rey Mysterio from another attack by someone on the main roster, which they mentioned Lars Sullivan here, but Lars Sullivan is now on SmackDown Live. We will have to wait and see what happens because it appears WWE is still undecided on what they want to do as far as the roster goes with the shakeup. This is an awful idea. This is an awful idea. First of all, there's no major heel on Monday Night Raw, yet you want to take the one guy who could be your major heel and turn him into a baby face. You do realize that nobody on Monday Night Raw is heel enough to challenge Seth Rollins as the Universal Champion. He got Samoa Joe, but he's the United States champion. He's probably dropping that title to Braun Strowman within the next month or two. There's no legit heel on Monday Night Raw. Yet you want to take Andrade and turn him into a fucking babyface, leaving your brand with no fucking heels outside of Samoa Joe. 
and the usual suspects, the boring ones, of Baron Corbin, Bobby Lashley, and Drew, Ma- and Drew McIntyre. That really doesn't signal change after the shakeup. If those three guys are still on the same fucking brand. Yeah, you got AJ, but how long is AJ going to feud with Seth Rollins on Monday Night Raw for the Universal Championship? Not long. So WWE, this is a terrible idea. Now, I pitched a stable idea many, many, many months ago, and I actually think this is a great idea. You got two options here. You got two options here. One, you already broke Chad Gable and Bobby Roode up. If this is WWE's idea to turn on Drade Babyface, then the only other heel I could see being a potential threat to Seth Rollins is a repackaging of Bobby Roode, and I mean bringing him back to the NXT version of Bobby Roode. The dick who comes out just better than everybody, throwing his money around, wearing his snakeskin shoes and fucking $5,000 suits. That's what we need to see. If WWE's plan anyway, being that they broke him and Chad Gable up, if WWE's plan is not to turn Bobby Roode back to that, I don't see what the fucking point was of breaking them up. They were just getting their feet wet as a tag team. I just started actually becoming a fan of what they were doing. And WWE broke them up. So you got two heels right there, in Andrade and Bobby Roode. But if you want to get a heel stable together, why not take Bobby Roode, repackage him, give me the NXT version of what he was doing on Monday Night Raw, package him with Andrade, and package them with Samoa Joe in sort of a main event mafia-like stable. I think that would be great. We need a threat on this show that's going to overtake Monday Night Raw, that's going to inject Monday Night Raw with some fucking, you know, bad guy influence. We need something like that. This show has not had a major heel in God knows how long. And no, Baron Corbett is not a major heel. I'm sorry. Bobby Lashley is not a major heel. Leo Rush... It's not a heel act that I can believe in. Drew McIntyre's fell flat, fell off the face of the fucking earth after what WWE did to him, generating no crowd reaction whatsoever. I like that idea. I really do. And WWE continues to say the shakeup is continuing into late this week. They have yet to make another move since the original move after Tuesday night, moving heavy machinery and Mickey James and Liv Morgan to SmackDown Live. Samoa Joe is yet to be placed on a brand. Neither is Nikki Cross. Maybe Bray Wyatt ends up on Monday night repackaged. We don't know. We don't know. That's another good idea that they could do and utilize. Because we don't need him on SmackDown Live. He could be on Monday Night Raw repackaged. He could be a heel to challenge Seth Rollins for the Universal Championship. I actually like that idea. And a lot of people are talking about with these vignettes with the with the haunted house and the fucking buzzard coming out of the box that looks like a fucking cigarette ad. And that doll, that creepy doll that laughs. The last one we've seen. A lot of people are saying that that it could ultimately be Nikki Cross. So we'll see what happens, man. I don't know. There's a lot of ideas that WWE could do. The thing is, will they do them? We'll have to wait and see. But that stable of the Mexican trio, maybe they're the ones who stole my fucking money. And wanted to go on a a fucking Mexican cruise or a Mexican resort style vacation. Anyway, speaking of Andrade, WWE's plan for Andrade and Zelina Vega on Monday Night Raw. Dave Meltzer said on the Wrestling Observer Live that WWE is going to focus Zelina Vega's talents more on leading Andrade on Raw than her role as an in-ring performer. Yeah, that's quite odd being that there is no women's division on Monday Night Raw. So now, when there's no division, you want to focus Zelina on Andrade. When right now would probably be the best time to utilize her on the show. Even if they wanted to use her. I would not want her wrestling. I want her as an advocate for Andrade. I want her as a manager to lead him to championships. This is what made the entire gimmick special in NXT. She didn't wrestle. She only came out and wrestled when Candice LeRae was getting involved with Johnny Gargano. Zelina Vega always aided Andrade by standing at ringside and being meticulous with her spots. That's exactly what she needs to do. They put Zelina back with Andrade. I mean, she's always been with him, but they spent so much time with her as a wrestler, which kind of made her ineffective, and they've tried to go back to the original plan of their booking. 
end quote. Zelina Vega might be slowing down her role as an in-ring performer to take more time on as Andrade's business partner. It's a very good start for Andrade on Raw as he defeated Finn Balor in a non-title match. So we will have to see where they go with Vega and Andrade on Raw. You build this guy up as important and you make that act stand out and you make them heelish with the way that they did it in NXT... Within a month or two, this guy will be a great challenge for the Universal Championship. Believe me. Believe me. They need a credible heel on this show. They don't have any. You failed with Drew. Lashley's a joke. Corbin is a joke. Samoa Joe is a heel, but I don't see them pushing him to that limit. Andrade is your guy. Bobby Roode could be your guy. Let's do it. I could see Andrade and Rollins. Andrade is a champion. Maybe AJ Styles versus Andrade for the Universal Championship. There is a sense of newness and freshness right now on SmackDown Live with the amount of opponents that could be for Seth Rollins in the Universal Championship. What is WWE going to do? They'll probably give us fucking Baron Corbin and some lame Universal Championship feud when they got all this talent on Monday Night Raw. WWE could have written Bobby Lashley off of TV. That's the best news I heard all week. Bobby Lashley was involved in the main event on Raw as AJ Styles made his big debut on the Red Brand to assist Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins in winning a generic, same old, same old, bland and boring six-man tag team match that we've seen since November, by the way. Probably even before that. Dave Meltzer discussed this contest on Wrestling Observer Live where he said that it seemed... Like they were writing Lashley off of Raw. This could be interesting. It might allow Bobby Lashley to refresh his character if he was switched to SmackDown Live. He ain't going anywhere. He wasn't drafted to SmackDown. He's remaining on Raw. We don't know what he wants to do as far as his career goes. But I read that he was upset that WWE did not or doesn't have any plans to give him Brock Lesnar. The biggest question is what is going to happen to Leo Rush if Lashley does eventually leave the WWE to try his hand at MMA again. Only time will tell what Vince McMahon decides to do in the end because he can always wake up on Wednesday morning and decide to change everyone back to their original places before announcing a redo and then after that saying the brand split is all over. However, they did leave a pretty big door open for Lashley's exit from Raw without damaging any ongoing storylines for him on the red brand. Good. Good. Every time this man is on television, it is some of the most unexciting fucking television that you could possibly watch in WWE. He offers nothing. I don't care how legit he is, and it might not be his fault completely. This is WWE booking him in a manner in which was fucking boring. Now, this guy left WWE. He went to TNA. He was a multi-time champion over there. I would not be surprised if WWE just scooped him up because he's a familiar name. WWE fans are going to be quick to associate themselves with Bobby Lashley. They scooped him up. They didn't really have any big plans for him because if they wanted to capitalize on Lashley and Lesnar, they could certainly fucking do it. I'm sure Lesnar would be up for it. Lashley's been wanting it for years. Why didn't they do it? Why has Lashley been punished? And a run with the Intercontinental title means nothing. They didn't give him success with that Intercontinental Championship. Bobby Lashley's done nothing. He's done nothing of note. Shield, shield, shield. Loss, loss, loss. Look good one week. Get buried four other weeks after that by Roman Reigns in the Shield. He did nothing. How long did he last in the Rumble? He was one of the quickest guys eliminated, I believe. What did he last? Like 60 seconds? Less than that. This guy was buried from the word go. And I think it's the same thing as EC3. He went over to TNA to make a bigger name for himself Comes on back to the WWE, wants this, this, this. He wants Lesnar. He wants to be uh, a major name on the show. WWE said, ha, 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 ha. No way, man. No way. This guy is a product of WWE being spiteful. And I don't really care for Bobby Lashley. I never cared for Bobby Lashley in TNA anyway. He's boring. But I do know that WWE is vindict vindictive in their own ways. They're doing it with EC3. I would not be surprised if some of that is residual going to Bobby Lashley as well. Why The Miz was moved 
to Monday Night Raw during the Superstar Shakeup. I don't know why. Now, a lot of people were like, well, isn't Shane McMahon on SmackDown Live? Isn't he the, the commissioner of SmackDown Live? This is how unintelligent people are. It's like they forget. Didn't you hear the McMahons come out and say that they're running the show as if we didn't know that already? They did away with GMs. They did away with the commissioners. Shane can show up on Monday Night Raw if he wants. He's not SmackDown exclusive. He was on SmackDown Live because he was feuding with The Miz, who was SmackDown Live exclusive. But Shane McMahon showing up on Monday Night Raw has nothing to do with him being the commissioner of SmackDown Live. It actually makes sense for him to show up on Monday Night Raw because the McMahons as a whole show up whenever they want. They're running both shows. So The Miz and The Feud was moved from the blue brand to the red brand. It doesn't matter. It was one of those interchangeable feuds. You could do it on any brand. Now you could do it because Miz is on Raw. And Shane could be everywhere. Now Brian Alvarez said on the Figure Four Daily that it was suggested to him that WWE needed another day to promote Miz and Mrs. Because ratings for the season did not meet expectations in any way. Season 2, that is. He says, and I quote, I believe, I don't know this for sure, but one person in the company did suggest this to me. The reason The Miz is now on Raw is because that gives him an extra day to plug Miz and Mrs., which apparently the debut number was not good. It was lower than, I believe, the lowest number from season one, and that was the debut season of two, season two. So I guess if Miz and his show are being promoted on Raw, then they got an extra day to promote Miz and Mrs., and I guess they figure that that'll maybe help bring the rating up. So there you go, end quote. So they moved Miz to Monday Night Raw with no plan at all, except, well, we need to get over his cheesy reality show, so we'll move it to Monday Night Raw, which, honestly, if you look at the ratings, is not doing that much better than SmackDown Live. So, you might get a slight increase over there, but that was their reasoning for moving The Miz over to Monday Night Raw. had nothing to do with Shane McMahon and the the feud. It has to do everything with Miz and Mrs. So there you see WWE's uh, priorities. Reality shows and everything that is not the quality of Monday Night Raw. The fucking damn shame, ain't it? It's a really, really fucking just unbelievable situation that this company is in, man. Everything but the quality of the shows is more important to them. Bobby Roode. WWE nixes Bobby Roode and Chad Gable and their storyline for no reason during the Superstar Shakeup. Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Live said there was a plan for Roode and Gable to be broken up, but the Superstar Shakeup Put an end to that quicker than they could have told. Now, Bobby Roode and Chad Gable, he says, we're building that team up to do a split with Bobby Roode going heel. That's all out the window now. Roode and Gable would have been a great rivalry that lasted a couple of months to help elevate both of them if they were able to perform in the ring as singles competitors. However, that is not going to happen now because the Superstar Shakeup split up their team before they even had a chance to implode on their own. And this is not the only team that they broke up. They broke up the fucking Riot Squad. I, I never liked the Riot Squad to begin with. I think Ruby Riot is great in her own right. But they took Liv Morgan away from the Riot Squad and put her on SmackDown Live for absolutely no reason, no explanation at all, just because of them wanting to do it. Now, from what I gather, they all got matching tattoos of their debut together. So from what I can tell, just based off that, those three women traveled together. They were best friends on screen and off screen. They did everything together. They were super happy being together. WWE and the environment that they're creating don't want any happiness. They split Liv Morgan up from the Riot Squad. They kept Sarah Logan on Raw because she's married to Roe or Ivar. Oh no, who is it, Eric? I don't fucking Eric. Now... Hanson, Ro, Ro, she's married to. Ivar. Fucking garbage, man. This is I'm confused. They're making me look like an idiot with these fucking names. Sarah Logan's married to Ro of the War Raiders. So they move Liv Morgan, which I don't understand. This is just one example. That's a tag team. Now, Ruby Riot and Sarah Logan. 
can still team. I don't know if they're going to go under the, the Riot Squad. They could still team. But I don't know what WWE is going to do. Why are you going to keep the Riot Squad together if you're moving Liv Morgan away? Don't you think Liv Morgan should be a part of the Riot Squad? What makes you think that Liv Morgan is going to survive on her own on Monday night? The reason you put her in the Riot Squad was because she wasn't able to do it on her own. You put her with a Sarah Logan. And you put those two with a Ruby Riot because she was the matriarch of that. They fed off of Ruby Riot. And they still are nowhere where they need to be. Now you took Liv Morgan away. What do you think she's going to do on SmackDown Live? She's going to sink faster than the Raw ratings. And I feel sorry for her. I really do. So you ruin that. No sense whatsoever. Nia Jackson and Tamina Snuka are no longer a tag team. Not because they broke them up, but because Nia Jax is going to be gone for a very, 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 very long time. Double ACL surgery. Tamina hopefully stays off television. There's no tag team there with the Samoan Steakhouse anymore. So what are you going to do? You got no tag teams on Monday night. WWE wants Beth Phoenix to come back. WWE wants Beth Phoenix to work more dates on Monday Night Raw. Why? Because they foolishly and unceremoniously broke up all these tag teams. Now they're thinking, oh shit, we have no tag teams. Let's call Beth Phoenix and get her with Natty because we need a tag team on Monday night. There's no other tag team. You broke Bailey and Sasha Banks up. Boston Hug Connection's gone, right? Mickey James has moved on to SmackDown Live. Alexa Bliss has no tag team partner unless you want to pair her with Alicia Fox, which doesn't make sense at all. Who the fuck wants her on television? Dana Brooke. Need I say more? WWE's women's division on Monday night, and then you got Becky. Then you got Lacey Evans. But they don't factor into a tag team division. This is just the logic of WWE. Break up all these tag teams and leave no tag teams on Monday night. Now you got the Iconics on SmackDown Live. Who do they have outside of Asuka and Kyrie Sane as far as a tag team, legit, to challenge them for those titles? Nobody. They did the same thing with the men's tag team division. You got the Usos, right? The men's tag team division is great on Monday night. Will they exceed expectations? Probably not. Will WWE do anything with them? Probably not. But Rude and Gable, you moved. Chad Gable to SmackDown Live. Remember when they split him from Jason Jordan? What did they do with him? Nothing. Then they moved him to Monday Night Raw. They still didn't know what to do with him. They paired him with Bobby Roode because he was doing nothing. And they finally caught fire a little bit. They were tearing down house shows with the Revival. They were becoming a legit team. They got matching outfits. Gable got fitted for the robe. They were wearing the same outfits and looked like a legit tag team. The glorious ones. Now you moved him on to SmackDown Live. Did he benefit at all from that fucking tag team? No. How is Chad Gable going to get over on SmackDown Live when you pulled the plug on a story that could have eventually gotten him over? As a individual performer. I don't know. I, I don't get the logic. And then Bobby Roode, poor Bobby Roode. He made SmackDown Live after they called him up. Made him into a babyface because of his theme music. Then he went to Monday Night Raw. Sank like a fucking rock. Paired him with Gable. And now he's on his own again. What is the plan for Bobby Roode if not to go back to his NXT version. Well, the NXT version of Bobby Roode. What is it? This is ridiculous. And then people say, I complain for the sake of complaining. You don't see this? You can't surmise this on your own? Look at the women's division. They have no tag. You have tag team titles and no tag teams. You don't even have tag teams in NXT. Yet everybody wanted tag team titles. Who was right? Who looks like a superstar? I do. I told you this was going to happen. WWE did it in quicker time than I could have ever imagined. And they took the titles off of Sasha and Bayley to put them on the Iconics, which is a double whammy. Joke. An absolute joke. I don't understand the logic here. But those are my thoughts on that. 
I don't know why it's so difficult for people to come up with ideas of why they do these things. You don't see the wrong in that? Come on, man. You don't have a fucking plan for them. I don't know what to tell you. I really don't. Moving on. I got a plan for you guys to get something for free just for listening to the podcast today. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. Use that link, our unique link, right there in the little thumbnail that my boy Sal Rex has put together. Audible is an official sponsor of the show. All you're going to do is use that link, go through the sign-up process, enter your billing information. You will not be billed at all. Go through the sign-up process, download the app on your Android or iPhone device, and you'll be on your way to getting 30 days free of Audible. Yes, 30 days free of Audible and one free audiobook of your choice. There are over 200,000 choices to choose from a lot of which are wrestling-related, some of which you can see right on the screen, right in front of you, man. Here's the best part. You got the 30 days. You got your free audio book. One free book. And if you guys don't like Audible service, you can cancel at any time in between the 30 days. You can cancel on day one, or you can cancel on day 30. If you cancel, you still get to keep your audio book for free. Once again, that's audibletrial.com slash off the script. Great way to support me and the podcast by virtually doing nothing more than listening to the podcast, man. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. We are reaching the tail end of the podcast here, man. Three more stories for you right here on the podcast. Sami Zayn. Got news on Sami Zayn. My boy Sami Zayn. I'm loving his gimmick right now. Sami Zayn is killing it on the microphone. Sami Zayn just recently came back from injury. He had a IC title match with Finn Balor out of the blue. It didn't make any sense, but uh, it was there. And it was probably one of the better things on Monday Night Raw that week. But Sami Zayn is back with the WWE. And he revealed during an interview with TVA Sports in Canada, he revealed when he was cleared to return and WWE actually froze his contract. Sami Zayn returned to the ring on Raw. He was sidelined for about nine months, underwent double shoulder surgery, fixed two torn rotator cuffs, and he was out of action for about nine or ten months. Sami Zayn noted in this interview that he had a lot of inflammation in his shoulders as of late, and he's still not 100% yet. He says, and I quote, I feel my shoulders and arms are heavier than usual. Even after nine months, I'm not exactly sure uh, where I should be at this point or where I would like to be. But just before these recent episodes of inflammation, I felt the best that I've felt in a long time. End quote. Sami Zayn also revealed two other interesting things. First, that he was not cleared to return until the week before. And WWE officials told him about the return just two or three weeks, uh, two or three days rather, before WrestleMania 35. So it was two or three days before WrestleMania 35. Also, original plans called for him to do a promo then a backstage segment, then finally the match with Finn Balor. At one point, WWE considered him having a return at the Royal Rumble in January, but he wasn't ready. The second interesting thing was that he signed a three-year contract with WWE shortly before leaving for surgery last year. As of this writing, he has around 2.5 years left on his contract as WWE froze his contract due to taking time off with injuries. That's what WWE does, man. They freeze your contract. They uh, are going to be doing that a little bit more often now because they don't want you to go anywhere else. If you are out and you are on a contract term with them, they are going to freeze your contract because they want to maximize what they got in you uh, to an extent, and freezing the contract is going to get WWE to that point. They do not want you sitting at home, not working for them under contract so that when your time is up, you go somewhere else like an AEW, especially AEW now with all the buzz that they're creating and a TV deal looming for the fall. They don't want that. So what they're going to do is they're going to keep you under their lock and key. They're going to keep you under their supervision. They're going to freeze your contract for nine months. They froze his contract for nine fucking months, and he's going to make up all those months that he was out. That's exactly what they're going to do. Sami Zayn is not the only one they've done that to. They've done that with Rey Mysterio. And before he left, the last time he was in WWE, they did that. And it's not going to be the last. 
that they do this with anybody, man. It's It sucks. It's a really shitty tactic, but I, I can understand that WWE is a business and they want to maximize what they got in you so that they get their most bang for their buck, but it is a shitty situation in the end. So hopefully he doesn't get hurt because I would love to see Sami Zayn thrive in WWE. I feel like he has not been given an opportunity at all in the company. His best days were in NXT. His best match is still that Nakamura match at TakeOver Dallas. They have not even come close to doing anything like that with Sami Zayn on the main roster. Hopefully this gimmick is it because I'm enjoying it so far right now because it's got it's got doses of truth in it and it's real. It's genuine. And I could see him playing this role. I could see him being that guy to say what he's been saying on TV so far. I think it's great. We'll see what happens. Ronda Rousey just had hand surgery, or I believe it was a pinky. She got her pinky fixed, and it was a lot worse than WWE anticipated. She was actually photographed with a cast on her right hand, but she's going out. She'll be out for the rest of the year, and she's going on a vacation, and what she called an impregnation vacation. Sounds like a good time. Now, Ronda Rousey worked a year straight with WWE. She could likely come back and work a Brock Lesnar schedule, but that's completely up to her. I don't think she would want to do that. I think she wants to be entrenched in everything WWE is doing when she decides to come back. She doesn't like talking about her reproduction, but she recently broke the silence in a big way. Rousey uploaded a picture of herself with Travis Brown on Instagram with the hashtag impregnation vacation. Seems that Rousey is set on starting a family with Travis Brown, as previously reported in the previous weeks. This would definitely set her out for at least nine months if she gets pregnant, but the reality is it could be even longer if she does plan to make a return. Now, the thing is, will WWE freeze her contract because she wants to go on this impregnation vacation? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what Ronda does do, and when she decides to come back to work, WWE would love to have her back later this year, and already left the door open for a match against Becky Lynch with the way WrestleMania 35 ended. From the looks of things, Rousey and Brown might already have gotten started on the next chapter of their lives together. Um, I think Ronda, honestly, after everything that we've seen from her, she should go away anyway. No matter what reason, she should go away for a little bit. She did what she needed to do. She got the division to where it needed to be. Now it's on WWE. This is the next natural progression in the women's division. Ronda's not there. Now it's in WWE hands to take everything that Ronda Rousey did. There were some bumpy fucking roads on, on Ronda's first year. There really was. I'm not saying with her. You know, she was still growing as a performer, but there was there were bumpy roads on the women's division per storylines. Not everything was... Uh, Sunshine and rainbows in the women's division, even with Ronda Rousey there. It, it finally got to a point where we all felt it needed to be around the Survivor Series when Becky got involved. And Becky's face got broken, and then they teased the match with Becky and Ronda at the Survivor Series. That wasn't the case. They got Charlotte instead. Becky won the Royal Rumble. Everything started to take shape after the Survivor Series. Now it's in WWE's hands to make the division take that natural step to where it goes next. I don't think they'll be able to do that. With Ronda out, WWE is going to go right back to where the division was before Ronda even signed a WWE contract. This is what I feel. There is no excitement in the women's division right now. I honestly feel Becky and her momentum is declining. And I would not be surprised if WWE takes that Raw title and puts it on Lacey Evans. Which is another fucking sham. Bullshit. You go right back to the Sasha Banks thing that I talked about in the beginning. Change? You just inserted one blonde in exchange for the other. Charlotte for Lacey. Becky says these things. Everybody laughs. Ha ha ha. It's true. Charlotte 2.0. It's like WWE has a type. I don't understand how people are excited about this or how people can deem this fair. Oh, just watch the product for what it is. Oh, just enjoy it for what it is. Meanwhile, this woman has had one match, and she's already in a championship match with Becky Lynch. She's done nothing. You talk about the Iconics not paying their dues and not really earning it. The fuck has Lacey Evans done? What has she done to pay her dues? Who did she beat? 
She didn't run through any of the divisions. She ran through fucking Natalia Nightheart. She didn't run through a Sasha. She didn't run through an Asuka or an Ember or a Ruby. She got no wins under her belt. Yeah, let's give her the fucking women's championship. I hope she falls flat on her face. I really do. It's disgusting. How you take this division that Ronda has given you on a golden platter with Becky Lynch getting the win over Ronda, Ronda's first loss, and you go right back to pushing divas. Mind blown. Unreal. Another thing that's unreal is Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman destroying EC3 on Raw during the Superstar Shakeup. Why? Well, aside from Dean Ambrose and a win over Dean Ambrose in February, EC3 has been a proverbial jobber. He's been losing matches at live events. He was destroyed by Braun Strowman on Monday night when he was choke slammed through the staging area near the announcers. We've been hearing about this for months from everybody. Word going around is that he's in the WWE doghouse and nobody seems to know why except that Vince McMahon is not very fond of him right now. It's surprising because many looked at him as a potential breakout star on the main roster due to his look. Now, the Raw beatdown was not in the original plans. There were reports that that segment was planned for Samoa Joe, but Joe was sick with the flu, so the decision was made to have EC3 get beat up in order to fill time uh, in exchange for the original segment. That was supposed to be Joe featured with Braun Strowman. During a dark match last week, EC3 was accompanied to the ring by Drake Maverick as his manager, but that that idea seems to be have uh, just disappeared in midair already. Dropped like a fucking bad habit. No sign of Drake Maverick with EC3 on Monday Night Raw. Why? I don't know why. I really don't. And I'm going to say this, and I said this time and time and time again. This obviously stems from him going over to TNA and then coming back, and then they realized that Derek Bateman was still here, and they were like, oh, fuck this guy. You know, he went over to TNA to uh, become uh, EC3 under the Dixie Carter regime. He's back here thinking he's going to find the same level of, of success. Fuck you. That's exactly what they did. Braun Strowman destroyed EC3 for absolutely no reason. Why this guy was even called up to the main roster after being highlighted in video package for weeks that this guy's coming to Raw or SmackDown, and here he is, and all we seen was him being a mannequin and a mute and a, a fucking... I don't know, a fucking catering VIP. He's there spraying his fucking body with water. He's being dumped by, uh, he's being shit on by all the divas in the back, all the women in the back. It's disgusting. Absolutely no plans for this guy on Monday Night Raw. Why he was even called up. He looked like a, a decent hand in NXT. Why he didn't generate any interest down there or develop a fucking brand and momentum for himself down there. No, we'll call him up. He's got a good body. He's got a good uh, good hand on the microphone. We'll find something to do with him. We don't know yet, but we'll find something to do with him. Yeah. Braun Strowman's next casualty is EC3. Finally, guys, we're going to get the hell out of here. Sean Ross Sapp discussed what a WWE writer told Vince McMahon before quitting the Hall of Fame. That R.D. Evans, Robert Evans, that was on the creative team that helped Bret Hart write his promo at the Hall of Fame, and then Vince was so pissed that this guy thought that Vince was going to fire him, so he ended up quitting. Well, Sean Ross Sapp discussed this during his post-Raw recap show. While talking about Vince McMahon's questionable decision-making skills, he revealed that R.D. Evans actually said to Vince McMahon before quitting backstage at the Hall of Fame. Now, what he actually said was this, and I quote, Now, we had a great, or we had a head rider step down, Road Dog, and another rider, Evans, immediately walked to Gorilla, shake Vince's hand and say, I hope you learned something tonight. And then quit his job. If that's not an indication of the boneheadedness and stubbornness that sometimes goes on in that space, then I don't know what the fuck is. End quote. Vince McMahon was upset at Evans for mentioning his name during Bret Hart's induction speech. McMahon said that he was furious and gave Evans an earful before his rider of two years simply walked out and quit on the spot. I hope you learned something tonight. He learned nothing. Clearly, all he learned was a Viking experience. He didn't learn jack shit. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. If you guys do 
want to follow me on social media. JD from NY206, both on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Make sure you guys go get your t-shirts, man. JD's Elite. Link is down below in the description of this very video. Harry's.com slash script. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. Go and check out all the other videos that you've seen on the channel this week, or you might have missed, I should say, on the channel this week. Link is in the annotation that you see in the top right corner of your screen. And if you guys want to support and help Ricochet's family, link for his GoFundMe page is down below in the comments section of this very video and will be down there all weekend long, man. Thank you guys so very much. Hit that thumbs up, and I will see you right back here for part two of Off the Script. Until then, have a great Friday, guys, and I'll see you right back here on Saturday for part two. I'll talk to you later.